Jimmy Lunsville was a visionary for the city of Troy and the and Pike County. He enjoyed being with people, he enjoyed working with people, and he loved the city of Troy. I think that's probably one of the reasons that he was a great mayor. Uh, I've heard him uh, comment several times on uh, the great things that were done in the past by previous administrations. He studied that, uh, evidently, and uh, saw some of the things that they had done, and uh, he just was very complimentary. I think Troy's always had good leadership in things that they did. He enjoyed working with uh, the people at Troy Regional Medical Center and the Pike Medical Foundation. That was truly a passion for him. Troy University, that's another one of his passions. He cared very much for Troy University and uh, enjoyed working with Jack Hawkins and the other staff. K&W Can, Kemper, Golden Boy Foods. Uh, we've had just tremendous growth in, over the years in Troy. I guess one of the things that I would like to think that uh, could happen in the future for Troy and Pike County would be that people would take from his experience, uh, take from his knowledge that he had, and uh, while he was working with them, that uh, maybe they could use that as he used it from previous administrations and hope that, uh, you know, it'll just make things better for everyone here. I've been working hard way too long Friday's coming and it won't be long I've been hoping, I've been wishing Papa and me could go night fishing Down on the river, that's where I'll be. Down on the river, that's where I can be free. Well, the reason that I ride the golf cart around the neighborhood is in the last few months or so, the community neighborhoods changed so much. You got meth heads walking the streets day and night. They're going in people's mailbox, UPS, leaving packages, stealing packages off of people's porch. And I ride through the community and back in certain places and just so I can watch, just try to keep an eye on things, so uh, report their activity. Also, my grand youngins love the golf cart. They they come to the house, they go to the barn and get the golf cart, and, and uh, that's the reason that, uh, that I ride the community mainly for all the uh, night activity and the walkers that come through. The people around the community call me the mail. And up and down the valley, they say, ho, oh, ho, Mr. Mayor. Well, my daughter, Joy Lunsford, her father-in-law in Troy has been the mayor 25 or 30 years, Jimmy Lunsford. And I told her that if he could be the mayor down there, I guess I could be the mayor in Riverview, Rabbit Town. She went shopping in Birmingham. Uh, and she had this help made for me while they were shopping and she gave it to me at Christmas. Back during the Depression, the reason they call it Rabbit Town was uh, times got hard, food was, the, the food got real scarce, <coughs> and they said if a rabbit run through a yard here in Riverview, he didn't stand a chance, he was gonna be uh, in a skillet and be fried. 
Well, I met this little lady, Rosemary Smith, the way I got here to Riverview. And we kind of fell in love, you know, how it goes. And uh, we married later on. And I spent four years in the Navy doing the Vietnam era. And when we got discharged from the Navy, we came back here. She wanted to live in her hometown. And I worked in the machine shop at Riverdale Mill, Riverview Mill. It was a real experience working down there. Uh, being right on the river, as it was, and uh, everybody worked real hard. Well, the, the mill down here, Roy Shack, was real important for the employees of the mill at this time because they run a dope wagon, is what it was called then, through the mill at lunchtime and at about 5 o'clock in the evening for the evening meal, and then they run it for the night shift. And they had on there, had hot dogs, hamburgers, cakes, drinks. There was no drink machines at all in the meals. And then, of course, we had to, had to, had the stores up here, up on top of the hill here. We had the gymnasium, we had a theater, we had a drug store, we had a barber shop, we had a G and M uh, grocery store. We had a post office. The post office was in the in the uh, in the store up at Manly Hunt store. Well, because I was born in Riverview, I was born in my grandfather Bledsoe's house in 1936. October the fifth, my dad worked in the in the mill, and uh, so I I grew up going went to Riverview school, and uh, through the ninth grade, then I went to to Valley High and graduated from there. When I was growing up in Riverview, I was born in forty nine, so uh, that puts me seventy two now. So when I went to school, first we had to go to kindergarten and we'd go a half a day. And then uh, after the kindergarten, and you went on the first grade, everybody loved Ms. Moore, the first grade teacher. And even my old age, I can still name every one of my first through eighth grade teachers. When me and my twin turned 16 years old for our birthday present, my mom gave us an application to the meal. We thought, what? She said, yes, this will be the birth, best birthday present you ever had because you'll be able to get a job, you'll be able to earn your own money, you'll learn about spending money wisely, saving money, and this will help you. I'd gone to work in, in Rubdale Mill when I was 16, and I'd worked in the, in the mill until I went in, in service. And then when I came back, I went to Fairfax Mill and worked there for several years. Then in, in uh, seven, uh, 69, uh, I went to Lanier Mill, which was out on the interstate out there. Lanier Carter is the manager of the Lanier Mill. Then they transferred me back to Riverview uh, as the manager in 73. And Carrie and I moved. At that time, if you were a mill manager, you had to live in the town where the mill was that you were managing. Riverview, like all the uh, small villages here in the, in the what's called Valley now, each of them had their own gym and had their own recreation program, and West Point Pepperell paid for it. Right there now playing softball, we had a short right field. So Mr. Humphrey, he got tired of people knocking the softball against his house, knocking the, the siding off of it, hitting the roof. So they made a higher fence. Well. Some of them guys, not to me, but some of them other guys, I didn't matter. Heck, they were still knocking that ball up and he'd grab him ball and go in the house with it. I worked with this guy that uh, lived down the country, about 12, 14 miles down the country from the job site here in Valley. He's quite a character. He uh, had an electrical problem in his trailer, so he asked the electrician here at work, could he come down? He said he's scared his trailer's gonna catch a fire. He's scared to sleep at night. So the electrician told him, said, I'll be down Saturday. 
so the electrician goes down to sell out his wire and he goes to the back and he sees a little section of uh, dirt uh, tore up ground like a garden out there. He asked the guy, I said, uh, what you go what you got going on out here? You got your have your garden? Well he told him he said, No, uh, no garden. He said, There's a car down there. And the electrician said, a car? And he said, yeah, I got two people, got tired of people aggravating me about that car. He said, there's a Volkswagen down there. He said, I just buried it. He said, it took me about two weeks to dig that hole. He said, after I pushed it off in there, it didn't take me two days to cover it up. I said, well, after I heard that story, yeah, uh, dear, it worked when I when I, when he came around. I never took my eye off of it because uh, that th that was uh, just a little bit too much. Then I'd play pee wee football, but heck, I probably didn't weigh 45, 50 pounds, and I'd get hit. And my darn helmet was so big, I'd look around. I was looking out of the ear hole, you know, and I'd had to put a belt around me up under my jersey to tie my pants up, you know, because that'd be done fell down. And then, God, some of them big boys get on top of me, and I was saying, get off me, I'm smuggling on this place, you know it. Of course, we had a Boy Scout troop, Mr. Bob Harden. He was principal of Review School at this time, and he was a scout master. And at the time after Bob Harden gave it up, Mr. Harden, he turned it over to Jim Frank Clark. Mr. Clark turned it over to Seymour Sands. And Seymour, he was a good one. He had been in the Army. And there was a tale about Seymour. Seymour was, he'd never been married. He was about six, one or two. And then physical shape, good shape. And after World War II was over, he was in the Army. Mr. Hunt up there, that man I was talking about, he was fine, man. He was strong as could be. He reminded you of the fellow on the soda box, you know, showed his muscle like that. Well, that's the way Mr. Hunt was. He was just all that. And Seymour had always wanted to make Mr. Hunt get on his knees, squeezing his hand. But he never could do it. So when he come back from the army, all he done is sit around out there on his steps and he'd squeeze balls. And he'd say, I'm going over there and make Old man Hunt get on his knees, and he said he walked in there and grabbed Mr. Hunt's hand and said, "Bow!" He put him right back on, back on his knees again. He never did fool with Mr. Hunt no more. He said, "Mr. Hunt's the man of the year." <laughs> then I'd play basketball, and like I said again, I was short, but I could shoot pretty good. But I'd drive in for a layup or something, and I'd get the ball not right back in my face. This this was quite an experience coming back to Riverview. Uh, where I grew up as a boy, and I was now managing the mill where all the people that I grew up with were, especially the older people. And uh, some of them uh, gave me a hard time. And of course, there were some people that worked in the mill would come here and stay in the hotels. And there were some of the people that was raised here in Review. They was, they was living in that. The, when the hotel burnt, there was one man got burned to death in it. So then after then, all that was gone. The working conditions in the mill, especially upper spinning, card room, were very hot. Those ladies worked in 90 degree weather up there. And one Saturday afternoon, we was getting ready to go home at four o'clock. Well, the ribbon, the tail grace runs right behind the, the shop. And the lady came out from up, up a spinning. And I was out back to the shop getting ready to come home. And she came out and she was hot and sweaty. And she looked at me and said, Homer, I'm not never going back up there in that spinning room again. Well, she wasn't walking out the gate because she lived right out on GI Street, just 200 yards away. Well, 
The husband worked in the shop. He got off after her, and he went home. She wasn't at home. So he got to looking for her. Well, they went down the tail race right out the gate, and they found her, a pocketbook with her shoes, sitting there on the bank. And you could see where she had was standing. They had left her feet prints there. She had dropped in the river and drowned herself. She just couldn't handle no more, and she could not swim. And about an hour later, some guys on a boat picked her up on some limbs down the river right there where, where she had uh, washed on down to. Yeah. It was real, it was real hot place to work, but it, people made a good living in it. They had, a, they had about what they needed. They just had to work for it back in them days. The economy started to decline when they went to sell it out. The people in New York, at the main office for West Point Pepper. Went to sell it out overseas, moving all the textile industry overseas to China, uh, Taiwan. And finally, they shut the mills down. People had to move, get new jobs. People moved out of Riverview, up and down the valley. They had to move to go find other work because they wasn't. It wasn't anything else, you know. The mill was the backbone of this valley. The Texas mills was the backbone. And you have very few mom and pop stores now. Which we do have a, we do not in Riverview. You don't have nothing now. We have the we have boat landing everybody likes and and uh, but we don't have per se no stores or nothing that people can go down there right to right quick. The turbine and the weird water wheel has been removed off from under the mill where the river run through, and it's over here in a parking lot over here at Fairfax. Uh, it's real interesting, but it seems like since the mill shut down, there's more drug traffic, as different people moved in the neighborhood. The, most of the old people have died out and gone on. And it was just an entirely different community than what it was years ago. All right, well this is, these are the two bosses. This is Daphne and Poppy. And that's uh, Speck and Millie and Janice and Marceline. I'm kind of known around here for my goats, which they're actually my wife's goats. Um, when, we, when we first bought this place, the back was all, the back four acres was really grown up and I wanted two goats to to uh, clean the area off and I got two goats and then my wife took over and she got one more and then she got five more and then we started having babies and um, I mean we, we, we sell we sell probably 15 to 20 every year every spring but we have babies every spring and uh, yeah they're a lot of fun and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of known as the crazy crazy goat guy of Riverview but actually it's my wife. Well the Facebook page Beginny's Eye and the neighborhood watch that kind of came out of that was just in a response to a lot of petty crime that had been happening. Mostly what people report and what we see on McGinney's Eye a lot is um, people walking through people's yards at night um, and you know people will be on people's uh, security cameras and you know when the police stop them, they say we were just passing through, and they, well, why did you, why did you check the door handles on the car? You know, petty theft. You know, just picking up whatever you can grab, grabbing something out of a car that's unlocked. You know, unlocked cars are a big problem, and people are starting to learn that. Well, I'm the good watch when we go to uh, when I go to work every morning. It's about 15 to 6, and you know I see the strangers coming up through there, mostly at McGinney's Crossing. And uh, there's been, well, I seen one the other morning. I don't see them as much as I used to. And especially not down, probably not down my way because we've got a lot of guns down this way. <laughs> but uh, I think they know to stay up from down here. The walkers are, uh, you know, I, we, I guess they're mostly people with drug problems, you know, and they, they, they walk. They don't walk down here as much uh, because we have, there's a lot of dogs down here. Uh, I have dogs, neighbors have dogs, and they draw attention to them. 
Um, they mostly walk on California Road, California Street, um, but they're just people who just walk, and they usually have backpacks on, and they look suspect. The biggest problem in Riverview is, is uh, a lot of vacant houses, um, and you get a lot of these walkers that squat in the houses, camp out in the houses, whatever. Uh, and I think that, you know, people have, you know, passed away and their house was passed on to a, a relative, you know, and they didn't look after the house. And, uh, I mean, these houses are houses that don't even have any resale value. And in turn, they bring our property values down, you know. Um, and I think that's probably one of the bigger problems, you know. We are here at one of the tent, tent cities, meth tent cities over the river. And this is the reason, we're going to show you the reason why McGinney's Eye got started. It's because of these tent city meth heads. This is the way they live. They stay here, they say they could stay up three days, nights. This is their condo, this is how they live. And at night, they roam the streets. And this is why McGinney's Hour started, so we can keep tabs, watch this at night and day. We got people that, that ride at night. This is a real shame. Uh, our parents will let, let, our parents will let the kids come to something like this. It, it's, it's the generation out here. Uh, I mean, I had a ply line on my butt. I know right from wrong. These kids was taught right from wrong. I hope they was, but evidently something failed somewhere. And uh, there was two or three of these tent cities like this uh, around the area, and the, the police had all got behind it and cleaned some of them up. It was on private property. This is on an island down here behind Riverdale Mill. And, uh, real sad situation. I grew up in River, Riverview and, I'm, and this river has always been a part of what we did growing up in the sandbar specifically so it was always an idea it was always a dream to possibly seeing it from out there like, somebody should do something on this river all right fast forward 10 years later I started getting into events uh, as a profession so working uh, events around the country working festivals and I was like, well, I could I could learn what I can out here on the road and possibly bring that back to small town valley. Never really thinking I could actually pull it off here. I kind of thought we would do something here in the valley uh, at the airport, this public spot. But luckily, this property came up for sale and being related to my dad went to high school with the people that uh, that got selling it, so it just kind of worked out. Just getting you know, so he would only sell it to someone that was local to the area. Actually, it was it was pretty solid that he wouldn't let go of it otherwise. I guess in the mid 90s, late 90s, all the boats started parking here. And when my son got this place, we cleared it off down here, decided to try to make something out of it. Play out there, you might as well get a dollar from them. <laughs> but we enjoy it down here, especially when they're not generating. It's good out there right now. We get some barbecue people come down here and some vendors sell ice cream and barbecue. We eventually try to make it into a campground. That's the plan later on. Back, back when I was coming up, about the biggest motor you seen in this area of the river would be about a 10 horsepower Johnson. My daddy had a 9 horsepower Firestone we used to come down through here. And on Saturday and Sunday you might pass two, three boats all day long. Uh, Uncle Leroy, he had a 10 horsepower Johnson and he stayed on this water. And everybody went to back slew with the straight through the woods there, about 300 yards. And that's where you've done your fishing. As far as boats like this, you didn't see them up here. You didn't see them up here. They come up through here with these pretty big motors and they don't realize that a lot of times they're not in for about two or three feet of water. They, they just don't know this place. So, things have changed. As long as they're out there having a good time, taking trash with them, be a little respectful for the kids out there with the music and stuff. Nothing wrong with it. You know. um, the Facebook page, actually someone else that lives on the street brought the Facebook page up um, and added me to it way later. I wasn't even, I didn't even know about that until I got, until I moved down here. And I was added to it. 
and I figure that's the way to, to reach out to the people that I don't know around here. I do most mostly know the families around here. But yeah, it's a good way to, I don't know, communicate between us younger people and the older folks around here. <laughs> it's a good good medium to use, yeah. Well, we're coming up on Wayne's old log cabin down here. He is a professional woodworker. I'm uh, showing you some sculptures I've carved. And uh, this is uh, one, this I have a black walnut stump. These were the roots that come out. And uh, I, would, I was going to do three horse heads and I decided I'd throw an Indian in it instead of having it all the same. And I've uh, stopped carving for a while, but I'm about ready to get back into it. I'm going to touch this one up and do a little more detailing. He don't, he don't get into all of the, the uh, art shows and I think, but when he does, he wins. He wins first place. But this one here, I carved the eagle first. It, it's a moose antler. And uh, I decided to I carved the face on it and didn't have a place to put it. So I said, well, I've got a forked tree here. I'll just take it and make a stand out of it. You know, I was just going to make a regular stand. Then I got to thinking, well, all right, I carved an Indian out of that. He's just that good at it. And uh, we have been friends probably 40 years. It, this is a, a American chestnut. I didn't know it when I found it, but did some studying on it. I, I cut into it and it's got beautiful wood, but this, this went extinct about 1900, so it's a very old piece of wood. And I carved the fish out of alabaster. It's a type stone that's real soft. It's real easy to carve. And kids, they love these fish. They want to learn how to carve them, so I need to start teaching. He wanted to build out here on the water, right on the river, so. Went to sawing timbers, dragging logs to the sawmill, which is on top of the hill up here. He cut them out, drag them with the tractor, we'd saw them, we'd go down and build. We'd run out, we'd cut some more and drag them and saw them and keep building. We'd just a little bit at a time until uh, he got his place built down here. But it's nice just sitting here on the river, just pick up a piece of wood and start carving on it and admire the beauty around you. This is why I enjoy being here so much. It's nice and peaceful. And nothing disturbs you much. Maybe an eagle's screaming every once in a while. And got a big tree out here, and he'll sit up there and scream and look around. He, it's like you're not even here. I don't bother him, he don't bother me. I had a camp right out here that burned for, had it for years. Lord William had it to start with. And Larkin Nard got it from Floyd and I got it from Larkin. We used to have some throw downs. We cook old hogs in the ground, on top of the ground. We had some guitar pickings going on. Fourth of July, we'd really have a bash over here. They'd bring tents, put them up in the yard. We're going to Nashville, guitar pickers are a dime a dozen. They own every corner up there begging for a job. And I was not that great, but I could do to get by. We played you know, local clubs, some out of town clubs, different types of birthday parties, that type of stuff. But we enjoyed it. We didn't do it mainly for the money. We done it for the fun of it. Well, we was playing one night. I forget what we were playing. But we had this one singer that he started out singing. And he got about halfway through the song. And he turned around and looked at me. And he I called me Emma instead of Emmer. He said, Emma, 
I forgot the words. So we just kept going and made an instrumental out of it. And that wasn't the first time we had to do that. The first time I met Floyd William, he uh, went over with a buddy of mine. He was going to cook a stew for him that weekend. We went over there. We walked in this jungle-like house. Had to walk across the board to go through the first room of it, one board. Went back in there. I said, somebody live up in here? He said, yeah, Floyd. He went to hollering for him. We went back there. He's laid up in a bed back there. Had four hounds up in there all piled up on him. I said, look at here. That man lives in this snake den. I guess them hounds kept him big old snakes off of him, I reckon. And he was a character. He had a moonshine still right down here on Sugar Boy Branch. What really tried, what gave me the time and everything to, to write these books was the, the virus. Uh, Carrie and I stayed in the house for a year. You know, we didn't even allow the children or the grandchildren to come in during this year. So I figured I, I need to do something. I don't watch television long enough and whatever. So I started started writing and I, and I had no idea about how it all worked. It was a lot more complicated than what I had thought. They were based on the stories that I was told as I grew up from some of the older men that grew up in the 20s and 30s and, and they told me stories about uh, going across a river, paddling up Flat Shoal Creek and going over and dealing with the moonshiners and buying whiskey. In 1913, the two Melton brothers and John Leake were killed over there. There's all sorts of stories about it. There was a story that was in the papers during that time, and there was a Riverview story. The Riverview story was that these three went over there. Uh, the two Melton brothers got mixed up with some of the women, the moonshine and women's women, and uh, they got uh, in, in, in trouble with them and, and they killed them. John Leake, according to the story, uh, they sent him home. They told him to go home. They didn't have a problem with him. But he got down to the river and turned around and went back and they killed him too. And so they found all three of them in the next few days in the river with ropes around the neck. So uh, that was a story that kind of triggered the, the whole my interest in, in writing these books. One of the other funny stories I can remember over the years, a couple of brothers, Norman and Tony, said if we was working on a construction job, Kimberly Clark building a paper mill, children's very all about So we working four days a week, we had to have somewhere to stay, like Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, we went home on Thursday, so we go out to this trailer park and this lady says I have one that sleep three and it was a little small trailer and we go ahead and we rented the thing it was it was pretty cheap like sixty dollars for three nights so we go in we move in so Tony's gonna sleep on the couch in the living room and there was an old bed in the back that Norman and I was gonna sleep on so we get in from work at eight and had to work in 10 hours. Tony said, I think I'm gonna go on in there and get in the shower. We're gonna have to take turns. We're gonna have to wait between showers cause the hot water heat is a little small. Well, Norman and I was sitting outside at the picnic table, sipping on some cooler. Tony went on in and in a few minutes, we heard him holler and uh, we went and run in there and he said, y'all come here. So we went in there and looked back there and opened the, opened the bathroom door and all we could see was Tony's head. The whole bottom, he got in the shower, taking a shower and the whole bottom come out of it. And he hit, the, he's standing on the ground. You go outside, look in there and you can see him from his knees down. He was standing on the ground. Y'all get me out and down in here. It was funny, we laughed for 30 minutes. So Norman and I, we had to stand on the ground and take our shower a while later. Well, we come in the next evening and I went out there and told that woman she's had a lawsuit coming on her. Look at my brother's leg. 
I, we want our money back. The whole bottom come out of that shower. Look at his leg, cut it open. We want our money back right now. So she said, well, y'all just calm down. I, 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 I said, you ought, to, you ought to be written junk like this to folks to lay down in. I said, Norman went back and got in the bed, and I said, I'll come back there. And I told him, I said, roll over. I said, I gotta have to get on this side. And he rolled over and the bed fell over. And it went across both my feet, like to broke both feet. Got out and looked, and the bed was sitting up on four cement blocks. We hurry up and got our money back and moved on from that. And we laughed about that for years. This is like the coolest, most laid by everybody knows everybody. I can go to any one of these houses and ask for anything if I needed something and they'd help me out in any way. But it's a really friendly place. And I mean, I used to fish right down the road down there from the time I was like 10 years old. And uh, my sister lives half a mile that way and cousin lives a quarter mile that way and a lot of people I know live here and it's just a really good place to live. I love the river, just old river red. You got good fishing, good hunting, good people, just you got good down to earth old just river folk raised up on the river. They look at one another, one have a heart stroke of luck. I said, uh, the rest of them will pick him up and carry him on through it. Just a good, tight-knit community to live in. Riverview is, <clears throat> excuse me, very important because when I came to Riverview to be pianist at the church, I met my future husband. <clears throat> and then we got married and um, we had one daughter. Um, my husband passed away four years ago, but um, I continue to stay here because I've grown to love it. I love where I live. Um, I love the community, love the people in the community, have great neighbors and, um, you know, they'll do anything to help when they can. So it's, it's just a great place to live. What makes it important, this is where I found my love. I found my wife right here, Ruth. I met her and I guess it was just love at first bite, I reckon, because we've been together. Uh, we've had our 51st anniversary already, so uh, she had to be a heck of a woman to put up with me all them years. Without this church, there would be no more gathering place for the like-minded Christians to come together. Um, it's been something that I've done since birth. Uh, I was born and raised here. I've been in this church 75 years. I have uh, led the music around 23 years. I've always been in the choir since a teenager. So it's very important. It's very important to the community to know that this structure is here. This These people are here as, as the pastor uh, alluded to this morning, the church is, is the people. The people are the church. So this building is a place for his people, his church to gather. We got a new plant coming in from Texas is what I see for the near future is as the supposed employee to top out I think around six hundred and fifty people. And we got the Kia plant up the road here, 15 minutes up the road here, that's employing a lot of people. And, uh, it's back on the rise after all the mills shut out, all the manufacturing went overseas. Uh, it, it's looking a lot brighter here in the last few years with the car plant coming in. Now we've got uh, John Soul's chicken plant coming in over here. And uh, I think everything's going to be this fine. The current state of the community is better than it was a few years ago. Um, mainly because we have a better uh, communication network through the McGinney's Eye and our neighborhood watch. More people know their neighbors. Um, so I think that's, that's been a great improvement. Uh, less, less, uh, less petty crime because we've had a few people um, that have, through, through, through cooperation, um, we've had a few people 
uh, you know, be arrested and, and incarcerated. And there are also some houses that have been, uh, re, you know, remodeled and, and, you know, people are starting to, you know, buy properties and fix them up a little bit. So I think, I think we're headed in a, in a positive direction, just very gradually. Several years ago, a good friend of mine, Donna Ray, and uh, Mike Coggins, a friend this year, we used to have what we call a real few horseshoe club. We used to get together every Thursday. We still get together on Thursday, but that was printed out in, I want to say about 95 and 96, somewhere along in there. Can you get it? You get that? No, see the little rabbit? See the rabbit on the side? Because we was always called Review Rabbits. Review. Not badly. Review. All right? Review. All right? And I'll tell you, I'm just so thankful that I was born and raised in Review. And I still have friends down there. I love Red View and I live here in Charlotte now, but I tell everybody, I said, you know what? My butt may be in Charlotte, but I left my heart in Red View. And as I can recollect now, the, the age group that I grew up in, there's only two of us still living in Riverview. We really enjoyed the, the, the time here, but other than that, that's about it. There ain't no better place to be. We've done a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting, a lot of just growing up. And I wouldn't take anything for it. And I was born in this house right here in 1931. And it was a three-room house at that time. And I was born in the corner right there. And I, that was about all the things that I had Remember, I'm talking about I know a lot of bad things. I won't tell none of them, but uh, all the good things, that's all I like to try to remember, not the bad things. But uh, it's been good. I've, I've had a good life. I can't grumble about it. I should have done better, but I didn't. But uh, I thought I'd done pretty good. I thought, I thought of it, I thought. I've lived, I've lived in Riverview about 38 years. I just, I just love where I live. Mm -hmm. It's just, I can't find another place like it. I'm here today on West Point Lake to make a, maybe a few wishes for the future on behalf of myself and Jimmy Lawson. I married a girl in Riverview 55 years ago and kind of just uh, transplanted here. And I hope that I have had a positive influence on the community. I hope that I leave a legacy of happy times and good memories. And no, I had a, I know that I have had a good life with them. Now, I want the family to keep real close together and know how important that is. Because family is everything.